got it going. Oh, yeah. For the, just a minute. For the benefit of those who are watching on YouTube and not getting to be here this morning, the reason we're kind of panning around today is ugly hat and ugly tie day. And uh, I just wanted everybody out there in YouTube land to just see how truly awesome and creative some of our folks can be. And uh, uh, I really wanted you to know, I don't always dress this well, but you know, uh, I, I, for today, I, I, I suffer for today. So mama told me don't wear my hat in the house, and so I ain't gonna wear my hat in the house, but for the benefit of a photograph, I would do that. So that's why things look the way they look and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. You know, I visited, y'all remember my friend Gary that visited with us a couple of three weeks ago. He's an optometrist, and so I double-checked with him to be sure I knew what I was talking about because, uh, you know, a lot of times I think I know what I'm talking about and I really don't. And uh, he kind of, he straightened me out and got, got me correct. There, there's a couple of terminologies in, in uh, uh, eyes that uh, we need to be sure we understand this morning, nearsighted and farsighted. And of course, in my infinite wisdom, I had the definitions kind of backwards and mixed up. And so he straightened me out and got me back on the right path. And Gary, I appreciate that. But nearsighted means I can see things up close, but I can't see things far away. Farsighted means I can see things far away, but I can't see up close. And that's why I have to have these. But now Robbie, on the other hand, she takes her glasses off to read and, and puts them on to drive. Yeah. And me, I, if I drive with these, we fixing to have trouble. <laughs> okay? I, I, don't, I don't need these. But uh, there, there's, that's the difference in the terminology, and I wanted to get those things kind of straightened out this morning. But we have a, our, our message this morning is out of Luke uh, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, and it's a story that we're all very common with are familiar with, and uh, uh, but I want to want to look back through it from maybe a little different perspective on things today. And so, if you would turn with me to Luke chapter sixteen, verses nineteen through thirty-one. Luke sixteen nineteen through thirty-one. And if I yawn a little bit during the message, don't worry about it. Y'all are not boring. It's just been a long <laughs> week and harvest time is going and I won't say it's going well, but it's going and that's, that's good. So anyway, uh, now there was a rich man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were, which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony and in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that uh, none may cross over from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house for I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if you do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Let us pray. Most gracious Father, 
Lord God, as we look at your word this morning, as we hear your word today, Father, let us see the truth that you have for us today. Let us learn the lessons and learn hear the message that you have prepared. And Father, you know the, the thoughts that we need to hear. You know what we need to learn, dear Father. Lord, I pray today that you will guide my thoughts and guide my speech and give me your words to speak. Not my own, dear Lord because mine are not worthy, but yours are. Father, may the lessons we hear today touch someone's heart. May they open someone's eyes to their need to know you. Father, I just pray today that you'll take this time and use it to your honor and to your glory. I ask all this in your precious and holy name. Amen. 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 As we read this passage this morning, we're all familiar with this. We've heard this lesson many times. I want you to stop and ponder a little bit. Here is a man, here's, here's a story of two totally opposite lifestyles, aren't they? Totally opposite lifestyles. We have a rich man. He lived <coughs> a life of excess. He had the finest clothes, the best parties. He indulged in any desire that came his way. He had no concerns for anyone else but for himself. He wouldn't even let Lazarus, poor old Lazarus, wouldn't even let him have the crumbs off the table because it was for his pets. Okay? The, and so he he's lived this lavish lifestyle. But was it his wealth that made him sinful? No, no, it's not his wealth that made him sinful. It was his attitude towards his wealth and his attitude towards other. He thought his, maybe his wealth made him a little better than anyone else. He put his faith and his hope and his trust in his, uh, in his wealth. His wealth caused him to be very short-sighted and he could see the pleasure of today. He could see the joy in the moment, but he could not see what was far off, could he? He was only living in the moment. Every day is a holiday and every meal's a banquet, as one of my uncles used to say. It was just living life for the moment. We have a lot of people today of all socioeconomic stratus that they live for today. They get their paycheck on Friday and by Monday morning they're broke because they got money in their pocket and they go and spend it on whatever they want to spend it on and then, then they're out of money. They don't have any, they have no future thought for themselves and, and they're just living from day to day to day. There's, there's some things to be said for that. We don't need to make too many distant plans because God has a way of changing them, okay? Mm -hmm. But when that's our sole thought and our sole desire is to feed my pleasure to enjoy whatever I want right at this moment. That becomes a sin in our life, doesn't it? And it makes us rather nearsighted or rather short-sighted. And then we see the poor man. Man, he's, it, it's, a, it's a drastic contrast, isn't it? From a life of leisure and a life of luxury and a life of, of abundance to a life of nothing. Man, his clothes are tattered and ragged and he has no food to eat. He's just begging for, for food and, and his open sores are on his body and the dogs are coming and licking his body, his sores to, to try to clean them for him. And I mean, it's a life of nothingness. Well, does his poverty cause him to be righteous? No. See, your socioeconomic standing is not what makes you righteous and unrighteous. I know a lot of wealthy men who have concern and have compassion and do godly things with what they have. And I know a lot of poor folks that are mean and angry and bitter and jealous and hateful. But see, not Lazarus. Because 
we, we know that Lazarus was a righteous man. But it was because of his attitude towards God. But in spite of the circumstances that he was in, in spite of the, you know, the, just the, the troubles and the turmoils and everything else in his life, the, the low state of life that he lives in, he still honored and praised God. And he wasn't bitter. He wasn't angry because he was farsighted because he knew this world is temporary. Whatever circumstances he was in, they're going to end someday, but eternity is out there. We know that he was a child of God. Why? It doesn't tell us that, does it? But how do we know? Because it gives us his name. The rich man, we do not know his name, do we? But we know the poor man's name. His name was Lazarus. And Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 says, but now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. See, God knows our names when we're a child of God. He knows our name, and he calls us by name. And so we know that Lazarus was a child of God because God called him by name. What a joy, what a blessing to be called by by name, by God. It would be as if the most important and influential person in the world comes up and says, hey, Justin, how's things going? I still re I, I remember to this day there was, a, there was a water well guy from Plains. And I mean, you don't talk about a rough guy. I mean, he's a rough, rough old man and just... Uh, not, not a real successful man, and I have no idea how they came into contact, but, uh, oh, the guy that's in, uh, was in uh, uh, the movie, all the Houston Dance Hall, what, uh, I'm, I'm way back there. John Travolta. Every, every year, John Travolta would call this guy on his birthday because they had run into each other and met each other. And so here you've got John Travolta calling this gentleman from, from Blaine's, Texas that ain't got two nickels to rub together. But, you know, and it, it, it's that same circumstance. God Almighty is calling you by name. Amen. It's two different lifestyles, but we don't know the name of the rich man because he was not a child of God. He was not known to God. There's something I want you to notice. There's, a, there's a, a lesson that I want you to learn here. We don't get to choose, or we do get to choose our attitude. We get to choose our attitude towards our circumstances, towards our finances, towards our life. We get to choose our attitude, but not our circumstances. Are we going to be nearsighted and live for the moment? Or are we going to be farsighted? Let's look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 19 through 21 right quick. I'm sorry, Matthew 6. I hope I didn't write that down wrong. Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We get to choose where we're going to put our treasures up. The rich man had stored up his treasures here on earth and he was taking full advantage of them and he was living the life that he wanted to live. The poor man, his treasures were stored up in heaven and he would get to enjoy them. Amen. The second thing I want us to see is that there's two deaths, two very different deaths here, if you will. Notice the death of the, well, first off, death comes to everybody, doesn't it? We're, we're not going to get out of this world alive. All men are going to die. See, the rich man, it says he died and was buried. His life was over. It's almost as if he never existed. 
You ever, you ever take a cup of water and stick your finger down in it and pull your finger back out? And that hole that you leave in the water is about how much impression this guy made on the world. As if he never existed. No one remembered him. Everybody forgot about him. They were just there for the good times. They were there for the party. And as soon as he was gone, well, hey, we're going to go find somebody else to have a party with. That's over. Let's go somewhere else. He, his friends forgot about him and he left no legacy. There's no recollection of him. Opulence and extravagance came to an end. It's just, it ended right there at his death. He had had no thought of no one but himself. And no one, and now, no one thought of him. You know, before he only thought of himself, and so now no one thinks of him. Life was great while it lasted, but it came to an end. It was only temporary. We don't know if we get 20 years, 50 years, 80 years, 100 years, some folks, but it's temporary. It's not going to be forever. But the poor man, the righteous man, we don't know if he was even remembered in death either by man, does he? Do we? He, he was a poor man. He had probably had no one around him, no one to be with him. He may not even have been buried. It doesn't say that he was buried, does it? We don't know, but what does it tell us? That God remembered him. And in his death, God sent his angels to carry him to paradise. Amen. All men are equal in death, aren't we? Job 1 and 21 says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We're all equal in death. See, Great riches did not prolong the rich man's life, did it? It did not buy him out of the final end, did it? He still died. It didn't matter how much money he had. You know, we've heard that Elon Musk may become the world's first trillionaire within the next month or two. But guess what? Elon Musk is going to die also. And we see abject poverty all around us and those people also will die and we're all equal in death. Wealth does not prevent death. It never does. Poverty doesn't hasten our death. God is the giver of life and God has numbered our days. But I, the thing I want you to really notice here, notice the finality of death. Once death comes, there's no changing course. We can't beg, borrow, and steal our way out of the consequences. We have made our final, is that your final answer? As the game show says, that we have no op opportunity to change our life then. There's no recourse. There's no mulligans. There's no do-overs. Death is final. Think about that. Death is final. But we also see that there are two destinies, two very, very different destinies. Look at the destiny of Lazarus. Angels carried him away and placed him in Abraham's bosom. Think of the picture of that. What does that, first of all, it refers to being in the presence of the Father. You know, we, they referred to Father Abraham. And so he's placed in the bosom of his father, of his family, of love, of compassion, of caring, of comfort, of rest. We see eternity. See, he has been farsighted, and he can see eternity. Then we look at the destiny of the rich man. Ooh, how many of you want that? destiny. He was in Hades or hell. He was in torment. He was in fire. He was in agony. Just sitting him down here with just a drop of water to cool my tongue. 
How tormented is that? You know what true agony? You know, every once in a while, my back really goes to hurt me. And I can go sit down in my chair and get my heating pad and kind of get my feet propped up and lean back and relax, and my back will go to feeling a little better. But agony is when that back goes to hurting and I can't do anything about it. And I know there's nothing I can do about it. It's just going to hurt, and it's not ever going to go away. See, the rich man, he also sees eternity. But boy, he sees it from a totally different perspective. Because, see, he's been nearsighted all his life. He's only seen today. He's only seen the moment. And if it's not what I want right now, I'll throw it away and get something better. But all of a sudden, he's having to see what eternity is like. Amen. See, the pleasure before him was more important than the consequences later. He thought he could buy his way out, but Lazarus had been far-sighted, hadn't he? He understood and realized that the things of this life are temporary. That life itself is only temporary, but then comes eternity. Life ends, but then for the saved, life begins. You know, we get to choose. We can't choose our eyesight. We can only choose our destiny. You know, some of us are nearsighted, some of us are farsighted. We, we can't, but we can choose our destiny. We can be farsighted in our, in our uh, choices. Second Corinthians 4 and 17 says, for momentary light affliction." is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. We think we know what we really like. I really like chocolate chip cookies, but I don't think they're going to be anything in comparison to what we're going to have when we get to heaven. I really enjoy a beautiful evening with gorgeous sunset and a light breeze and all. I enjoy it. I don't think that's anything compared to what it's going to be like in heaven. Amen. Philippians 4, 13b, Paul says it this way, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. See, we get to make a choice. We get to make a choice. But see, Grandma and Grandpa ain't going to come back from the grave and say, hey, yeah, you better do that because I've been here and, and this is the way it is. No, God's already revealed himself through his creation, hasn't he? Amen. God has shown us through his word who he is. He has shown us the truth of eternity. We see it in his creation. We have no excuses before God. We get to make that choice. He has even sent someone back from death, hasn't he? Jesus Christ rose from the grave Amen. to come back and tell us what it's like. But people don't believe him today. See, the only way we can cure our nearsightedness is if we accept Jesus Christ. Amen. It says, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. See, we get to choose. God gives us a choice. We can either tell God, never mind, I'm good for today. I'll take care of that later. But we don't know when later will be, do we? Amen. We may be nine, we may be 59, and we may be 109. But someday, we're all going to die. And if we die without Christ, we get the same fate as this rich man. Whatever pleasures we were able to have for the short temporary time that we were here on this earth is all that we will ever have. And then we will have torment and agony in the lake of fire. Amen. But if we persevere and we serve God and we love God in spite of whatever circumstances may come our way here in this temporary time here on earth, then 
we get to know. We get to enjoy the bosom of Father Abraham for all of eternity. And it's promised to us. It is guaranteed to us Amen. if God calls us by name. See, you're not promised tomorrow, are you? You can't buy it. You can't beg for it. You can't steal it. You can't talk your way out of the consequences. Open your eyes today. Check your vision. Are you being nearsighted in your life? Are you being farsighted? Are you living for today? Living for the moment? Are you living for the future? Are you living for what lies beyond? Beyond the horizon? Are you being farsighted today? Or are you being nearsighted? I ask you today to accept Jesus Christ and open your eyes to what lies beyond. Would you stand with me as we pray? Our most gracious Father, God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your lessons. Thank you for the teachings that you give to us. Father, I, I thank you for what I have learned and what I have gained from your word this morning. Father, I pray that you have spoken to someone else just as you have spoken to me. Father, if there's anyone today that needs to come and accept you and open their eyes to what lies beyond and not just live for the here and now. Father, let them come right now and accept you as Lord and Savior. Father, if there's some of us that have kind of gotten sidetracked, maybe put <clears throat> blinders on our eyes, and we're not seeing what we are to be seeing, and the weight of the world is beginning to drag us down, Father, open our eyes. Help us to be farsighted. We ask all this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. God speaking to you this morning. This is your chance. You don't know what comes down the road as we sing. Maybe not.